from Shalmaneser III, until Tiglath Pileser III, the king took the first eponymate and was followed by the commander-in-chief, after him came the palace herald and the chief cupper in an interchanging order, fifth was the treasurer. After the four highest officials the governors of provinces followed, headed by the governor of Assur. A major change in the system can be seen during the reign of Sargon II, when the traditional sequence of the high officials as eponyms after the king was abandoned and the Masenu was the only magnate to become eponym. Ezahadon was the first king not to take the eponymate and during his reign the vizier, the deputy vizier and the chief judge appear as new officials gaining this status. It is important to note that these three officials had no provinces attached to the office, a clear deviation from previous practice. As pointed out by Zawadzki, the eponymate of the king started the cycle of the four highest officials. The king could, by not taking the eponymate at the beginning of his reign, avoid starting this cycle of the highest magnates. Abandoning the fixed sequence of eponyms increased the power of the king in deciding whom to appoint as eponyms, and enabled the ruler to include new officials or to reward loyalty. The rise of two new officials, the chief of trade La Bay, eponym of 657, and the chief tailor Milky Romu of 656 to the office of eponym during the early reign of Asur Banipal reflects the rewards of loyalty. Both La Bay and Milky Romu belonged to the supporters of Asur Banipal. La Bay had shown loyalty to Asur Banipal during his accession, and the chief tailor Milky Romu as the official taking care of the royal insignia belonged to the close circle of the king. Milky Romu proved to be an important supporter of Asur Banipal, and he had a significant role during the revolt of Amun Mukin and Asur Banipal's campaign against Elam. The case of the chief treasurer of Sargon II may well be used as an example for the importance of individual merit. His multifaceted activities are well known from the over 40 letters that can be attributed to him. He was eponym of 717 BCE, the year of the founding of the new capital Jirurukin and was personally overseeing the building of the city. As chief treasurer, he was also involved in building projects in other cities, including the building of the Temple of Anu in Assur, houses in Kalu, and the transportation of basalt steps to Nineveh. He was in charge of assigning valuable materials and of the transportation of cultic objects. Abar or held an important border province, the land of the treasurer, strategically placed on the border of Uratu. His contribution to the Uratu campaign must have been significant, as he was given the honor of delivering the so-called letter to the god or in 714. The merits of Abar or are indeed impressive, and without the testimony of his letters, it would be impossible to believe the extensiveness of his duties. When a Sir Nazipal II reports on the festivities held for the inauguration of his new imperial capital at Kalu, he speaks of 69,574 people whom he provided with food and drink for 10 days. This account demonstrates the ability of the Assyrian king to organize the acquisition and preparation of thousands of cattle, sheep, game, birds and fish, large amounts of grain, thousands of liters of beer and wine, various different types of vegetables, herbs, spices, and fruits as well as honey, milk, and dairy products. The whole undertaking must have involved thousands of laborers and workers, with the king relying especially on his officials who delegated and coordinated the different operations and channeled the traffic of goods. Food consumption within the royal household can be basically divided into ordinary consumption, that is, the daily meal, and extraordinary consumption, on the occasion of festive banquets. While the daily meal was provided for the king and his inner circle, festive consumption involved a broader spectrum of participants, including the king's state officials, who maintained their own households, as well as guests and envoys from abroad. Hence, Asur Nazirpal lists as his guests 47,074 men and women from all over the empire, 5,000 envoys from surrounding polities, 16,000 inhabitants of Kalu and 1,500 courtiers of his palaces to celebrate the new capital Kalu. Similarly, Isa Haddon let his magnates and the people of his land enjoy tables richly laden with food and drink after he had completed his review palace, the palace that administers everything, in Nineveh. These sumptuous banquets were accompanied by the performance of offerings to the gods, that is, the royal meal attended by the king's subjects was preceded by the divine meal. This sequence of events is clearly expressed in the aforementioned account of Isar Haddon, who first let the gods of Assyria enter and consecrate his new palace before he invited his subjects for dinner. 
the regular delivery of divine leftovers, also over greater distances, to the king is by no means a unique practice in the ancient Near East. For instance, it is well known for the Neo-Babylonian period. Although the daily meal of the king for the most part may have remained unaffected by cultic procedures in the temple, and although the large-scale consumption of offerings leftovers, following the correspondingly large-scale performance of offerings, by the king's subjects took place only exceptionally or in greater intervals, the temple sphere was important for the food supply of the palace. Owing to a serious abundance of pasture lands and cultivated lands, the royal household could rely to a great extent on the country's own production of edible goods for its maintenance, but it also benefited from foodstuffs entering the land as booty, tribute, and gifts and obtained via trade. As for Assyria's own produce, the basic stages of the food supply were production, management, and preparation. First, meat, grain, legumes, vegetables, herbs, spices, and fruits were produced through animal husbandry, agriculture, and gardening, mainly in the countryside. Then followed the collection, the transfer to stables and storage facilities in local centers and the main cities, and the redistribution to kitchen facilities and other establishments for further processing such as slaughtering, conserving, and final preparation including cooking and baking. Depending on the type of food, a modified process was in operation, for example, cattle and poultry were fattened in the urban stables, while grapes were pressed and bottled already in the countryside, in regions northwest of the Assyrian heartland. With foodstuffs received from alternative channels, the first stage obviously took place abroad, but the subsequent management and treatment must have been similar to what happened with the home-produced foodstuffs. These alternative channels were particularly important for procuring goods that were not available, or scarce, in Assyria, such as wine and olive oil. These, of course, were processed already before they entered the Assyrian heartland. 